The first piece we're going to perform this week is a piece by Olivier Messiaen. I have been very much inspired by him for many, many years. And we have performed all kinds of different music for a few weeks now with all this piece. So when I thought about the season, I thought it would be nice to have some impressionistic sounds and to make the orchestra continue to develop and look and search for new colors, new suspensions, new ways of projecting sounds. So we are dedicating the first part of the concerts uh, to um, not only French music, but also a symbol about remember. Les Offrandes Oubliées, it's a piece Messiaen wrote when he was very young, um, which is unbelievable. When you hear the first bar, you think it's Mahler or Bruckner. Honestly, it's very shocking. But the idea of the piece is metaphorically that we all have somebody or something which at some point, without we know it or not, has done a symbolic sacrifice for us, for everybody. But we don't know, you know, it's just in the air. And the piece is written, it's a triptych with the forgiving, with the panic, and uh, with the peace. It's written that we can remember or know or give gratitude to this known or unknown person or symbols which sacrificed something. Again, it's a symbol for individuals and then it becomes something for a collective. So it's the choice of the tempo is so slow. It means that it is like an unstoppable way to push our brain to go, I mean, like a meditation you know, to the essence of what has transformed us or what has tried to transform us. It's not a statement again, it's just, you know, symbols to remember how we arrive where we are and could have we done better, yes, no, alone, with some unknown hell. It's really... Uh, a shocking piece because also for the audience it's an endless melody which has also a relation with death in the end like if you see somebody dying which i'm sure most of us have the way he extends the melody and the texture of the piece is like you can see a loved one about to have the last breath like and you hope that it's going to be and it's the last one it's Strong. Tilleu, it's a composer very close to my aspirations. I think he's a poet more than a composer, and he found his way in, in all the 20th century to have his own texture, and he didn't crack. kept his, his texture. And his texture is transparent, light, is almost never a downbeat. And if it's loud, is to, is to symbolize something terrifying. So in this piece, the shadows of time 
he wanted to uh, make us remembering the dark sides of the Holocaust. So in the first movie, for example, is called Les Heures Horas. So he has a temple block and a very brave on making the pearls, symbolizing the, you know, when you cannot escape and you count on the notion of time to occupy your brain. That's what he does. Without going into many details, he also writes a movement, is La Mémoire des Ombres, a Memoria das Sombras, uh, which is, can you imagine if you try to remember your own sombras, your own shadows? not very pretty because the shadows is what you don't want or what you can't accept for yourself as a person. He chose three children to sing simple words like Pourquoi nous, pourquoi l'étoile? Why us and why the star? And they think maybe not even three minutes in the third movement of the piece. And uh, his minimalist approach of the text, he doesn't want to make it melodramatic. He's just why, mixed with the shadows. I know that Ozespi had the brilliant idea to invite survivors of the Holocaust, and they will be there in the hall this week. So I guess these little words will very um, much speak to them, but they already speak to us because of course, such a piece you cannot rehearse with the orchestra. Ah, it's too late, too soon, too loud, too, too soft, too flat, and too, you know, so you have to speak very, very much about why and how this piece took birth. Why does it exist? What does the title mean? Because if you play 20 minutes about uh, shadows, you know, it's not like we played last week, we played Rose and Cavalier. <laughs> so it's very much uh, different. So the way of projecting sounds for the musician is completely different. And it's really what I wanted because in a, in a season, it's very important for the, um, for the musicians and for all of us to have this diversity. Then all the romanticism of Rosenkavalier last week is still in us, but we have to let it be suspended somewhere that we can give sense to the essence of this piece. The last movement is called Dominant Bleu, with a question mark. And blue is, of course, the symbol of the sky and the heaven and everything. But the fact that he's putting a question mark at the end of the title of the last movement, it means that no, nothing will, will ever finish. And he ends up, in the end, like Ligeti, was writing in Lux Eterna, we did um, recently, where the conductor has to conduct four or five bars in emptiness to see that actually, even if we are not there anymore, our spirits and our hopes continue to be present. It's so beautiful. And so here I am again, the last week of this series of concerts. Um, I'm sad to be leaving you, but happy to be playing uh, the biggest of the Rachmaninoff concertos, the third. This was the piece he wrote for his first American tour. 
So he wanted to show the Americans all he could do. And so in a way, this piece is like an encyclopedia of what it's possible to do at the piano. Rachmaninoff was a great pianist, and he puts everything into this. So, so there's octaves and chords and runs and there's cadenzas, two of them in the first movement. There are amazing contrapuntal effects, which he did so well. You have a melody on the top and counter melody in the middle. He'd also learned a little bit from writing the second. He wrote the second, the most popular one in a way. The orchestration is quite thick, quite difficult for the piano to get through, to be heard. He'd played the piece a lot, and now he comes to write the third. He's learned a lesson from that. This is a much less thick orchestra, although a very sophisticated orchestra, so you can always hear the piano even at the biggest moments, uh, which is quite um, skillful of him. But I think it takes the second concerto another stage. And whereas to me the second concerto is very warm-hearted, is, is, it has all of that kind of, um, it's like a big hug in many ways. It's got so many wonderful tunes. This piece is a little bit more passionate, a little bit more intense, a little bit more neurotic perhaps. The emotions are more, if I'm sitting here for the second concerto, I'm sitting here for the third. It's more on the edge of the seat more exciting in that kind of way. And there are many, many more notes. This piece has so many notes in it. Even he said once when he came off stage after playing it, I wrote this piece for elephants. In, in other words, it's so big, there's so much going on. Um, but it makes it fascinating because it's, it's like the pinnacle of the Romantic Piano Concerto. Other concertos were written afterwards, and one thinks of the second concerto Prokofiev has an even bigger cadenza than this. But no con composers ever quite reach this mountain of combination of romanticism and melody and virtuosity. It's the absolute end of that style. And it's always an unbelievable joy and challenge to play this piece. Now this piece is played by all um, virtuoso youngsters. I mean, hundreds and thousands of people play this piece. Yes, at one time it was thought that it couldn't be played. Um, very few people were playing it. I think actually it was really Horowitz who brought the piece fully into public. Um, Rachmaninoff didn't play it as much as he played the second, uh, and other people were very much playing the second. A, a pianist like Rubinstein, for instance, played the second a lot, but never played the third. Even Joseph Hoffman, to whom the piece was dedicated, one of the great pianists of all time, he never played this piece. I don't know why that was. People have said, certainly not because he wasn't a great virtuoso. It's quite a lot of uh, big stretches, and Hoffman had a small hand, but I just it takes a lot of time to learn this piece. You can't just learn it quickly. There's so much detail in there that you need the time. And I think this may be put off Hoffman, who at that point was busy playing concerts and didn't want to spend so much time. One of the clever things about the third concerto is that he uses the same um, material um, in all of the movements. You'll hear, and, and you don't even notice it really, but it's, it's hidden in. For instance, the wonderful sort of Tarantella waltz at the end of the second movement, um, the, the figuration. It's the opening theme of the first one. Da, 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 da. So it's whirling around, you don't even really notice it, but it's all there. So I think this is not just a piece that's just romantic virtuosity. This is a piece of a really skillful composer. And Rachmaninoff loved to do that also in the last movement, the middle section. It 
it's the second subject of the first movement changed um, into a different way. I mean, it's, it's what Wagner, of course, did in his operas, the light motif, which undergoes many different transformations. But he uses it here not to uh, tell the character of an opera, but just to show different skills and, and using different materials. And of course, this use of material goes way back to the Renaissance period of composers when they were very interested in turning melodies upside down and, and putting them side by side and putting them in a canon. So Rachmaninoff does his own little, little thing with this piece. <laughs> 